Distribution provided by Cloud Sigma, the cloud that adapts to you. Visit cloudsigma.com slash thisweekend for a free $200 credit. Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Use promo code TWIST and get a free month of New Relic Pro. To redeem, visit newrelic.com slash thisweekend and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by MailChimp. Manage lists with up to 2,000 subscribers and send up to 12,000 emails per month for free with MailChimp. Hey everybody, it's Jason Calacanis, and this is This Week in Startups. Today on the program, uh, entrepreneur and now founder of AngelPad, Thomas Corte is with us. He's a um, really interesting character, lots of insights, helping build tons of companies here in San Francisco, a lot of success, and a lot to say about starting companies, funding them, and making them successful. Stick with us, it's going to be a great show. Hey everybody, uh, welcome to the program. It's me, Jason, your friend, serial entrepreneur, angel investor, journalist, and uh, just samurai out there fighting the good fight like you guys are, trying to build companies, trying to make a dent in the universe. And one of the ways we do that uh, in my humble little operation is to host this podcast, which we've done for over 300 episodes, and now somehow 100,000 people are downloading every episode, and people are tuning in on Stitcher and TuneIn Radio and iTunes Podcasting and YouTube. It's really grown into a really um, big operation here, and I'm very proud of the team for putting together uh, such an amazing program. And today uh, will be no different. We have an, a great, great angel investor and um, somebody who runs one of the most respected uh, accelerators in the entire industry, AngelPad, Thomas Corte, is going to be with us. Uh, and he started at Google, internationalized a lot of the Google products into Europe, and um, just really considered guy who I've gotten to know over the last couple of years. Very smart. And you're going to learn a lot today about starting companies, raising angel rounds, and, and just the struggle uh, that it is. And hey, uh, we couldn't do it without our friends at New Relic. New Relic, thank you so much for sponsoring the program. New Relic helps you monitor real-time user experiences. Here you go. Taking a look here at basic uh, page load times. This is very important stuff. Marissa Mayer told me at one point that the best feature they ever added to uh, Google was making it faster, right? And every time they made it faster, usage went up. Add a feature, maybe usage goes up, maybe it doesn't. Make it faster, usage always goes up. That's one of the basic tenets of the internet. But do you know if your pages are loading fast on the browser side? Do you know if it's the network? Do you know if it's the application layer, the software that you're writing? Well, that's what New Relic helps you do. And you can follow them at New Relic. Here you go, monitor. Uh, all these different uh, aspects of the speed of your site, including the application layer uh, and you know how your Ruby's running, the server layer, the disk utilization, network IO, all the important stuff. And you know it gets very granular, but the good news is they put it all in a nice summary report that I get every week. So then if, I don't have to think about the stuff, right? I'm the CEO founder. But when I see the report and I say, wow, you know, uh, our page load times are 15% slower this week, but we had 100% uptime, and uh, our page views are down, I can start to have a really interesting conversation with my tech team, my product team, and say, what's going on here? Um, and, and that's really what you're looking for if you're an entrepreneur. Uh, and that's why New Relic is sponsoring the program, because they really care about entrepreneurs and helping them succeed. And the server uh, and speed and the speed of your site, absolutely critical. And uptime is obviously super critical. Who uses uh, New Relic? Skull Candy, Spotify, Nike. Nike, Zillow, Vonage, all these great people trust their performance of their critical apps to New Relic. And if you want to get x-ray vision into your web, your web apps, you should get New Relic. Go to newrelic.com slash this weekend, and you will get one of these beautiful uh, twist t-shirts. That's right. Create a free account and get a free t-shirt. You can't buy this t-shirt. You can only get it um, at New Relic.com slash this weekend. Fast, easy, no credit card required. What an amazing uh, sponsor of the program. Thank you uh, to New Relic. And if you appreciate them sponsoring independent free media like this, just say thank you at New Relic on your Twitter account. With me on the program, Thomas Corte, uh, founder of AngelPad. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks uh, for coming. 
yeah, uh, and I appreciate you hosting us here. That's fantastic. And I got to walk around with you and see all the creativity going on yeah. here. How many startups do you have here? So we have 12 startups in there right now. We usually right. do twice a year, 12 startups at a time. Yeah, and uh, what do you look for in startups and what do you provide to them? How does it work? All right, so we, we spend a lot of time looking for startups. We spend about half the year looking for startups, half the year hosting them here. So three months, three months, three months wow. is our schedule. And uh, you know, we, we get about 2,000 applications, so we have a very broad broad choice to, to go down to 12. Wow. Um, what we really look for, you know, it comes down to you know a, a great team that has a really unique insight into something. Um, and then wants to crack a really big market and to solve a real problem. Right. And we really have the gamut from you know, cloud infrastructure to B2B marketplaces to consumer companies to mobile companies, every, everything um, there is. And, and what do you provide? I mean, obviously, they're getting office space, but mm -hmm. I think mentorship is probably the key thing, yeah? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> no, we, have, we certainly have the office, and I think it's an important part, um, not so much because it's free office, um, much more because you're together with other founders and us 24-7, you know, not, not quite, but almost. Yeah. Um, you know, here for this for this period. You know, we the mentorship is really, I think, what it comes down to. You know, when you when you start a company, often you you have this idea, you have often a product in mind, mm. um, and you know, often a, a problem, to, a, a product that solves a problem. But often, you know, to to make it a venture backed large company, you don't kind of back out how big this has to be and what this really what this really means to raise a lot of money and build a large company. So we spend a lot of time on on market sizing, on 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 the problem itself, defining the problem, the initial customer set. Um, and we really are here with them, you know, every every day. And entrepreneurs overlook that, I think, in a lot of cases. They do. They do very much. Um, you know, when, when you start a company, it's usually you have a problem. Hopefully you scratch your own back, as they say. Um, yeah. It's always, you know, you solve the problem in a better way if you, if you have the problem yourself. Um, but making that a business is one step. But then also making that a venture-backed business is yet another step. What's the difference between a non-venture-backed business and a venture-backed business in your mind? How do you explain it to these new recruits when they come in? So a venture-backed, well, let me start with a non-venture-backed business. So I think there's, you know, it kind of goes down as, as uh, you know, the bootstrap business or like the, the business that's Built on revenue, and I, you know, I have nothing but respect for people who build companies like that. You know, this is, you know, this is this is the restaurant down the street, right? They have to get a loan to do something, you know, to make money to reinvest it, and eventually, you know, they 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 grow and they keep reinvesting. The same thing with, you know, a lot of, you know, software companies that 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 choose not to uh, to take venture capital. You know, like kind of, you know, uh, Forty Seven Signals. You know, great example right. building a large Thirty Seven Signals. Uh, Thirty Seven Signals. Right, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. It's extra, a new right? version. <laughs> yes, they've gone even bigger. They're up bigger, to Forty Seven Signals. Thirty-seven um, episodes, yes. They, but they took an investment from Jeff Bezos, so even they, they may not have gone venture, but they definitely true, but went angel. That's true. But they, they, for a long time, you know, they really have built. You know, let's build a product, let's sell it, let's build, let's build the company on revenue. And I think right. that's the big difference. You know, if, as a, as a, as a real business, you have to think about revenue mm. and how to get revenue to then grow the business. As a venture-backed business, you have to think about getting to scale, um, getting very, very large, and eventually charging for that. Uh, you know, a lot more people. People, um, than and it, and than why do venture-backed businesses take this approach of get to scale, then turn on revenue, as opposed to turn on revenue, grow with the revenue? Usually it is because you grow a lot slower if you, if you grow with revenue. You know, it's, uh, let's take Gmail. You know, if yeah. Gmail would have asked for a dollar a month, right, right, which we probably, you know, you, I know you would pay it, I would pay it, like no question. Yeah. Um, but it would have just not gotten to the scale where it is now. And, and, and when you're at scale, you have a different, different set of, of revenue opportunities that you just can't get when you ask people for money directly. I think what, you know, what the past you know, 10 years has shown us that you can build very, very interesting companies uh, without directly asking the customers to pay for for it. You know, obviously, you know, Google's a great example, Facebook, Twitter, and a lot of these consumer companies um, are great examples of that. Yeah, um, but people sometimes, in the, either in the industry or around the industry, will hate a little bit on companies not focusing on revenue. Mm -hmm. are, are they right to hate on it, or are they wrong to hate on it? Because you, you do hear this, like, oh my God, what are these people in San Francisco thinking? They're just spending $10 million, and they're not even thinking about revenue. Like. Are they, I, I hear do they have a case or are they just missing the point? I think they do. I think there's, you know, I look at it in two different ways. You know, when you, when you, uh, when you think about revenue, there's a difference between understanding your revenue potential and mm -hmm. seeing how you can make money in the future at what point and mm -hmm. kind of when that kicks in, kind of when do you lay your revenue on top of it, um, and just be, you know, pie in the sky, oh, we don't worry about revenue, we're going to be as big as Google, and then we're going to figure it out. I think those are the two different sets of it. And, you know, if you, if you talk to an investor in, in New York 
or in even in LA, if certainly in New York, in, 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 in London or in Europe, you know, revenue becomes really, really early. You know, it's like, how are you going to make money with this? Right. We, we focus a lot on that too. You know, we, we need to understand founders need to understand how to eventually make money with this. And in some cases, how to make money with it fairly soon. You know, on the B2B yeah. side, you actually do want to charge as a way to, uh, to, to validate. You know, people validate with their wallet uh, if something is a real problem that they're willing to pay for. In the enterprise community. In the enterprise, in the business yeah. side. Right. A lot of, I think a lot of businesses start you know, worrying about not paying for certain services. Mm. I think enough of them have, have had experiences where a company goes by the waste side um, or you know, changes, pivots, and all of a sudden they're stuck with something. And I think most businesses are willing to pay. Um, Certainly if they're getting value, they don't want to see the company go out of business. They want to see the company reinvest, Definitely, yeah. definitely. Um, but in Europe, they, the investors do demand revenue early, but in Europe we don't see the breakout successes, do we? We do. So you know, I'm from there, so I can't right. I can't talk uh, badly about them. But well, I think, it is the <laughs> truth. I mean, entrepreneurship is looked at differently, and you're yes. in San Francisco for a reason. Yes, no, exactly. And I think that's why we see a lot of international founders that have different aspirations um, come come out here, come to the U.S., come to Silicon Valley specifically. I think in Europe, you know, it's it's a, it's different market dynamics. You know, there is there is less access to capital. Um, the people who do invest tend to be um, with banking backgrounds, where where things make a lot of sense on spreadsheets and you can extrapolate out. Mm -hmm. You know, none of those rules apply at early stage, right? You can't you can't value a company, you know, on paper um, with a spreadsheet at the earliest stage, right? There's, Certainly not Twitter. Yes, yes, exactly. Right. I mean, you can, Nobody even knows if it's going to work. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's the, it's the case with, with most of these companies. So I think in Europe and most, most places outside of, outside of uh, you know, uh, San Francisco or, or Silicon Valley, I should say, um, revenue does become much, much more important. It's also, when you look at Europe, you, know, you have much smaller markets. You know, when you, the largest market in Europe is Germany with you know, 80, 85 million people or so. Right. It's a very small market. I mean, California is, is almost right. bigger than that. You know? right. So when you, when you deal with, with smaller markets, the, uh, the scale to which a consumer company has all of a sudden, you have to say, "Well, we're not going to get 15% of all Germans to use it. You know, we're going to have to get, you know, 50% of all Germans using right. it, and that's only 40 million people. You know, we're, you know, if you cut off the kids and the really old people, um, you know, it's just not yeah. that much left. So revenue becomes the uh, kind of the other, you know, factor that really plays. That you're, you're better yeah. off asking for money from 15% of the people right. than, 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 you know, never getting to a, to a real company. And so um, you spent time at Google. Mm -hmm. You joined in 2002. Yeah. Which I guess was maybe year three of the company or something, two? Uh, I, th I don't know. The counting is kind of, I think, yeah. I think they started in 2006, in 2000, in, sorry, in 1996, Researching, I think '98 is when the company kind of got off the ground. Right, so very uh, early. Yes, when I joined, I mean, there was no revenue, there was barely any advertising products. Um, so there's a perfect example of a company that went for it, making a great product, yes. and then turned on revenue later. Yes, it was. I think Google was actually a, a little different because Google had revenue through the through the deal with, with Yahoo. Yahoo. Yeah. Um, exactly, which you know, in, in hindsight, turned out to be the most genius. Get paid for distribu get distribution, get paid, get all the data, have the logo in the Yahoo and the Yahoo search results, which really you know, boosted Google. Hugest blunder in the history of Silicon Valley was Yahoo uh, putting Google as their search result instead of building their own. I uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah. I think so. But they're they're fixing it now with Marissa heading right. Yahoo. So that's a that's a you huge were there development. Before Marissa? No. She no. Was no. There Marissa. You. We had there were seven people, eight people in the product team. She was one of them. Really. And so, what was it like back then with Marissa? And what was the culture like back then? It what was, was Marissa about like back then? It was yeah. uh, Mar Marissa. Look, Marissa was the same smart person she uh, she's now back yeah. then. She was as opinionated back then as she is now. Um, she has strong opinions. She backs everything up with data. I mean, she's a she's a very very smart woman. Um, it's it's you know. Yahoo did a very, very, very good thing to uh, to get her um, to, to run the company. You know, back then, um, I think there was there was a clear understanding that we're building something very, very big, um, that we're touching a lot of people, that we have a chance to transform the way people um, look for information, that people use information. You know, when I mean, you and I, you know, yeah. when we applied to college, we sent you know postcards to get or called someone to get a brochure and then read through that. I mean, we right. had no insight beyond what the marketing material was like. You know, today, you know, the same thing is happening. 
happening with one click, any information you connect yeah. to other people. Like it's just a different world. Interacting and, with the students on a Facebook page, absolutely. asking them questions on mm-hmm. Quora, whatever the case may exactly. be. Exactly. You know, there's so much more information, there's so much more insight. The same has happened, you know, for access to information in Silicon Valley. You know, ten years ago, I mean there was there was no information about how venture capital works. It was just a you know a red velvet screen that you were invited into. You know, today there's between what you're doing, um, right. between what AngelList is doing, between all the blogging, the, the VCs that are very open about how things work. It was just in a different world than, than 10 years ago. And Is it easier? It's um, For entrepreneurs? I mean, or is it a false easiness? No, I think I think it is. Well, I mean, is it easier? I think what's what's easier is you need less money, right? So when sure. when I arrived in in in, uh, in in Silicon Valley, you know, I joined a company. We raised twenty five million dollars to uh, to kind of prove a concept. Um, and you don't need that anymore today, right? So, so we can we can com- you know, scale companies at a scale that, that we do today, that 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 other incubators do, uh, and really weed out, or rather, not weed out, like you know, have the have the have the uh, the cherries kind of picked out and really yeah. really accelerate. You can look- test at a low. Dollar amount. At, a, at a low cost, at a at a at a, slow, at a fast turnaround, at a fast know, turnaround. What's too. the time and what's the amount of time it takes to you know thoroughly test you know a, a business to know this is a good one, a bad one, an average one, or you know? I think it's very very fast. I think it's a matter of uh, maybe six months or so. Yeah. Um, you know the and business. And a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand, three hundred. If that, if that, I think most people, you know, if if you know, I coach founders. That are you know want to be founders in 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 some time out, and what I see is a lot that people don't think about all taking the right steps to become a founder. So one example is you know about the money. Um, in, you know most founders have more uh, disposable income than than anyone else, right? They work at Google or at Facebook. They make a hundred, hundred twenty thousand dollars. You know, sorry, sorry guys for the guys that are in, in other places where engineers don't make that much, but that's the reality here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know they. Uh, they can put money aside mm-hmm. um, and really like for a year put 20, 50, you know, 50K aside for a, in, in, in a couple of years' time to have that buffer to test something. I think the, the, the most important decision as a founder is to quit your job and do it full time. That's the most, right. It's one of the most difficult ones. It's one of the sca- most scariest ones. And how do you get them to do that? Because you must get of the applicants, mm-hmm. a lot of the good ones are people who are currently employed but telling you, I have this idea, is that correct? So we, we are, I think, one step beyond that. Um, in the application process, we really look for, for teams um, that have committed to it. Ah. Um, it's rare that we have someone that is in a company still. The only time that happens is when they have H-1Bs and they kind of have the golden handcuffs of Silicon Valley, ah. um, which is a whole different, different conversation. Yeah. Um, but uh, most... Most founders that we see have committed are about you know six months into it, you know, have built prototype, have have uh, you know uh, have ha- do have a kind of a hypothesis and assumptions, have validated those, and really are onto onto something. Um, the first iteration done. You uh, have a decent number of founders who've come from outside of the valley into the program, correct? And many from Europe. We have we have yeah. about. Uh, um, Let's say about you know twenty percent or so of the companies come from outside of outside of the U.S. Uh, most of them from Europe. So we have a very strong um, from the U.K. Very strong. We have some Australian, um, Singapore. Um, there are certain countries that really have an innovation engine, mm-hmm. um, and those those founders tend to tend to be the ones that come over here easy more and, easily. And do they have an advantage coming here? Do they work harder? Do they not take it for granted, like, say, maybe some of the people who have been here for 10 years? Do, do they appreciate it more, or uh, or they have a, a drawback in that maybe they, they think too small? I think... There's a, a fine balance between the two. I think you know I'm a, I'm a huge fan of kind of like the the immigrant entrepreneur. entrepreneur. You know I am. Um, I'm not saying like you know, I arrived here with nothing, but but you know it's really you 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 have a different you have a different background. You have a different outlook. You have a different educational system. Um, well, some of the values they're certainly different than the American ones, but you know a, a lot of them um, don't have that entrepreneurial spirit that the Americans have. On the other hand, a lot of them have like this you know very hardworking, very dedicated to something. One huge advantage I think that that companies out of uh, from non US or out of Europe out of Asia have is that they've spent more time on it um, so mm-hmm. before they you know they can't 
you know, leave Google, you know, you know, raise a couple hundred K a few weeks later and be like, so now what do we do, right? These guys actually, you know, have to have a product, have to have a, uh, you know, proven something out before they can come over the here. The benchmark's higher for them much to get higher. funded. Much higher. Do they have to, I mean, in the Valley, you could just have an idea and get funded by your friends or, you know, people who know people. Yeah. But coming from Europe, they actually have to have a product. Do they need to have performance on that product or they just have to have a product? I think a product, I think something that works, something to show that it works. Um, mm. You know, funnily, most of them have some sort of revenue. You know, we, uh, we usually be like, look, let's shut off the revenue, let's figure out how we can scale this without revenue. Um, and so they, they generally have, I mean, the bar is high. Look, if you come over here between, you know, the immigration visas, which we deal with all the time, it's a it's How a big of a, I mean, you, you talked about that and we're like, that's a whole side conversation, yeah. but sometimes the side conversations are the important ones. How, how big is the immigration problem for Silicon Valley and the United States on, on a, in a larger uh, picture. It's it's serious. It's very very serious. Why? Um, Why? Well, one is because we, you know, we don't have enough access to engineers. Um, so as you know, any single one of these companies sitting out here is looking for engineers. Um, there's just not enough engineers in the U.S. Um, to kind of, you know, feed the beast of Silicon Valley and, and other technology companies. Um, you know, with that, we really have two immigration problems in, in in my book. The one is the people that have H1Bs existing are in companies today and are tied to those companies, come the golden handcuffs because mm-hmm. they're always very well paid. They always work for very great great right. companies but they are tied to that company. And very few companies have policies where they let people leave and carry this on for even just a few months. Right. Um, it's very strict HR, you know, you're out, you have 60 days to, to transfer. Um, my wife has been in that position uh, before where she literally, you know, left the company. She had 60 days to find a new job or would go back to France. Wow. So it, it, is, it is real. And this is like, it doesn't matter how educated you are, it doesn't matter how wealthy or how poor you are. You know, this is a reality. So um, we're driving the most successful people out of our country. Amer- uh, America is driving I say, I mean, to get, the to, most, <laughs> some of the most talented people. We're talking about the top 10% of Yes, I mean, getting an skills. H-1B in the first place, you know how hard it is, right? right. I mean, this is, this you have is to not, show a unique skill. Absolutely, unique skill, you know, highly educated. You know, the people, for a company to, to sponsor you, it costs quite a bit of money. So for them to, uh, Five or to, 10 grand. to come, easily, easily. Um, for them to, uh, to sponsor you to come over here, you have to be really darn good. I mean, the bar is high to get an H-1B in this country. Um, and, you know, once we have them over here, I mean, they, you know, a lot of them establish their lives here, right? I mean, they, yeah. they arrive here when they're 22 or 23, you know, by the time they're, they're 30, I mean, life changes in that time, right? Yeah. You know, very much. Babies, you know, as, as you know, as wives, I know, right? husbands, exactly. sure. Exactly. So, so that's really, I think, one thing that, that kind of needs to be fixed, the H-1B. Yeah. Um, there is people in companies. And why are we blocking, why is the United States doing this? Is it because we just, there's so many terrorists coming out of France, <laughs> clearly, and I you know, mean, it's, it's, I, I say that facetiously, obviously. Right, right, right. No, I understand. I think, you know, immigration, you know, it's, it's I mean, you, you, you follow the conversation like I do. You're active in it like I am. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. It's, it's, it's sad. It's and sad, we have but. Obama as president, which, you know, Silicon Valley lines up to pay $30,000 yeah. to have lunch with Obama. 75. 75. Not me, though. I didn't, I didn't pay him. <laughs> it's, you know, and listen, I, I'm, I'm glad he got another four years, but how disappointing is it that Obama has not tackled immigration? I think immigration is a is a major issue. It has to be it has to be addressed. I mean, I mean, obviously we can talk about immigration overall, but like high skilled labor immigration um, Such has a to be has to be attacked. I I don't think anything in Washington is a no brainer. So, oh. I think it's you know when it when it comes to policy, things just take time. The the the, the great thing is you know, you know that's that's kind of when when I'm reminded you know I'm American citizen now. You know I became citizen uh, you know five years six years ago, and you you realize when you go through the political process and and you know get involved and at different ends that. At least there is a process that can induce change, both through through election, through initiatives, through lobbying, whatever it is, whatever it takes. And I think some people in Silicon Valley really have stood up um, and and kind of addressed this. But I want to the other part of immigration yeah. that I haven't talked about yet. So that's the one people that are already here that we kind of you know sending out. That we kick out. And we kick out literally. Yeah. Um, well done. The second one is you know coming over here, being somewhere, um, and then kind of starting coming over here to start a company. And right. it's it is not impossible. Like so, let's let's just put it out. Like if you are a skilled person. Person, it is not an impossible task to come here, but it is not easy. Mm. So far, we've had 100% success of our founders coming here. Sometimes there were some hiccups. We had one comp- 
company um, that actually left to live in Singapore for a year before they waited for the H1Bs to come through. Um, wow. So so it does it does happen. But a year waste, I mean, the, not wasted, but I mean they could have been yes. here getting the mentoring directly. Yeah, and, and create jobs. I mean they've oh. tried, hired seven people over in Singapore. Those jobs um, are not coming here. They're now back. They're now back. So oh, okay. they took they took those seven people with them. So mm-hmm. it was they knew it was a temporary solution, but yeah. you know, that's what had to be done. And but it it is possible to get people over here. It's expensive. It is it is time consuming. Should there be like a and I know people have brought this up. I don't I don't know if it exists. Um, shouldn't there be some way if you raise an angel round or a million dollars, you just automatically get like for every million dollars you get five H one Bs or something. That, yeah, that's a that's work a for you. <clears throat> it's, it's certainly thought. I mean, you know, I think putting money, money as a as a measure probably in, in, aligns the incentives incorrectly because you don't want to just raise money to get H one B. So okay, but so I, every I, I H-1B. think there certainly is. There's certain, look, I mean, the process there shouldn't be any limits on it in the first part. You know, right now there's, there's artificial right. limits on it. It shouldn't be a process that you know on October first you get all the all the all the mm-hmm. allocations for the year, which usually are in, in good years they're taken with, within days. In bad year, years they expire. I mean. It's just doesn't it doesn't make sense period what if we gave them uh, for every million dollars they raised two h1b's and then for every five people they hire five americans they hire they get a, a sixth yeah. h1b yeah I mean, it's a practical solution it, it, would, it would be very practical but I, I you know what i've learned through the last couple of years being a little bit, very, very much on the on the sidelines involved in, in, in Washington, D.C. I mean, nothing is easy. Nothing is easy. Everything is a deal. Everything uh, takes long negotiations, and there's always extreme opinions on both ends of the spectrum. And um, so let's right. hope that there's When we be... get back from the commercial break, I want to talk to you about some of the things yes. my audience asks me about all the time. Finding a co-founder, yeah. very hard to do. Mm-hmm. Pivoting and knowing when to pivot mm-hmm. and why. And then France... Socialism, 75% tax, and why we're not seeing great companies and entrepreneurship in France, or are we, and we're just not aware of them when we get back from commercial break. And it's the very easy commercial because it's MailChimp. E E E E E? MailChimp. That's it. <laughs> we use MailChimp. You use MailChimp. It, this is why my job is so easy. This is why the show, the ads are sold out for three, four, five months at a time because. We just pick the best products and we say, we use these products. Would you like to sponsor the program? People say, yeah, we like the program, Jason, and we love that you use the product. I use MailChimp every day. I've got three newsletters going out to 25,000 people. I sent two in the last two weeks. This is how I stay in touch with people. I email my list. Here are my thoughts on what's going on in the world. I wrote one about Tesla, and I wrote another one uh, about Facebook and Edge Rank and George Takei. And they're both like big thought pieces. But I don't put them on a blog because eh, who cares? I put them in the email box of people who matter, and then they reply back to me. And I got to tell you, this is the lifeblood of my career is sharing information and then getting back 10 times as much in return. This show and email are very similar. You put some great content out in the world, you get a lot back. If you're not collecting emails every day for your startup, you're crazy because MailChimp, it's free to have 2,000 subscribers and to send 12,000 emails per month. So as a startup, you might as well just put an email sign-up form there because, you know, social networks come and go. But email? Stays. It stays. <laughs> it's sticky. And how much are those emails worth? Five, ten yeah. $10 yeah. each? It's invaluable. 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 And, man, people have built businesses just on email and just on MailChimp alone. But it is at least 20% of your effort as a startup to be to build that mailing list. I'm telling you. And MailChimp constantly releases new awesome features like a mobile-friendly email templates, pop-up previews for mobile devices, drag-and-drop file uploading. And there's no contract, no trial. The free plan is always free, which you know, like, if you're really confident in your product... You just let people pay as they go. Absolutely, yeah. And you have, like you said before, a free program because you know that they're going to get value. Exactly, exactly. And at some point, convert. You've been using Belchamp for a while. We've been using, what's the first one we went to and never never switched away, so. That's what I hear from everybody. So there you go. See, I got Thomas to endorse Belchamp. Yeah. Yeah. There's another, you know what's a great feature this Every startup should look at this. Um, when you uh, when you have your email list, there's uh-huh. actually the, the social rank in there. You get like a full profile of every single person just by the email. Oh, I mean, this so is this great. is stuff through fundraising, wherever it is. It's it's just figure out who like, your yeah, who exactly, the baller people exactly, on your list exactly. are. Hashtag get on my level. Just figure out who is <laughs> in there. That's my favorite hashtag at the moment. Hey, listen, thank you, much. Okay, so finding a co-founder. Let's take that one. How? I mean, I hear people. I'm a programmer. I, I'm kind of shy. 
I'm not outgoing. I'm not going to be giving a keynote at any conference anytime soon. I, got, I get panic attacks when I talk to VCs, whatever, investors. I can't look people in the eye. I got whatever. I got, uh, how, did, how did they find a founder that I hear more often than not, non-technical people saying, mm -hmm. I need a technical co-founder. Right, that's true. That's true. How do you find that? And are you kind of snobby about who you accept to the program? Like, I, I hear Y Combinator is very like, if you're not a technical co-founder, Maybe Y Combinator is not the place for you is mm -hmm. what I hear over and over again. We, what do you think? We like technical co-founders too. Why, we why like, is everybody so biased? We like, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, we, we have a lot of business business product teams as well, product sure. business, you know, everything. But um, what's, you know, t in today's, and we talked about this earlier, when you, uh, when you look at, uh, you know, how much things cost, you know, if you can't code it yourself, it's going to be very expensive, right? Mm. And so I think if you can't build a prototype, if you have an idea and you need to pay someone to build a prototype or give them equity or whatever it is, it becomes expensive quickly and very mm. difficult. You also can't iterate as fast, right? Mm. If, if your product, something doesn't work, you try, do A-B test, you change it, like, you can't do that if you are not. It's not a static, like, I write a spec, I'll do it, and it's going to take off. It takes iteration. If you can't code, you know, learn to code. Ah, so you're behind the eight ball if you're just a business person. Absolutely. Now, what about people who are just great at user interface, making mm -hmm. wireframes? Is that as valid as being a developer? Or is it like the next rung down on your personal selection criteria? I think it's, it's, it's look, in a business, you need everything, right? right. You, need, you need someone that understands business. You need someone that understands customers. You need someone that... But um, for founding. Understand. For founding, I mean, we like teams... Above everything, I mean, we want to have a technical person in there so they can write yeah. it, but above everything, you know, we want teams that know each other, that have worked together, together before together. You know, you, you can't get divorced from your co-founder. It doesn't right. work, right? I mean, he owns, let's say, half the company. It is the, uh, the biggest dilution hit you will ever get. So people think about dilution through fundraising. The yeah. biggest dilution you will have is taking on another founder. Right. Um, so, you know, we really look for teams that have known each other for a long time, have worked together, have a, a common understanding and a rapport. Founder breaks up is just the most common reason for, for company failures in the earliest stages. Is it stages. really? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. No question. No question. I mean, and when they break up, there's no resolution. You can't put the genie back in the bottle and tell one co-founder to give your equity back. Uh, you can. I mean, usually it usually Hard. works. It usually works that way. But uh, you know, I, you, you go through divorce, you're scarred, right? You go through a founder break, breakup, you're scarred, and and not like publicly scarred, but just it hurts. Like you know, you yeah. thought this was right. You know, you, you built this with that person. You pitched with that person. Maybe you raised money with that person. Um, it's it's very very difficult to 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 take the pieces and 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 continue on if you lose your co-founder. And if it happens in the second year and they own 10 percent of the business, you have this dual resentment that goes on, right? Like yes, that happens a lot too. So that that really you know when. When founders think about starting, I mean, they need to think about putting the right structures in place. You know, you, you, everyone should have a four-year resting schedule, including every founder. There should be a one-year cliff um, so that if something does happen in the first year, at least there's not, you know, some, let's say, if it's half-half the first yeah. year... Um, you know, it, it, you could end up easily having someone 10, 12% of your company before you raised money, right? And, right? and we see that. We see people that come in having LLCs where they just say, oh, we're each half or 100% vest, vested. I mean, there's, you know, if you, if you start a company, you know, go to a real lawyer that understands how to start companies. Um, you know, it is the part, if you, you know, come to Silicon Valley, most law firms, uh, you know, reputable They'll do law it for firms, free. Do it for free, the deferred fees. Um, you know, it is the best money, the best 5K you spend if you have to spend it. Now, what about doing a price round versus doing convertible debt? Mm -hmm. Convertible debt's fast, but nobody seems to know what's going to happen with this incredible convertible debt bubble that's right. building. Mm -hmm. And is there, some people seem to be panicked about it a little bit, like, oh my God, it's all this debt's going to come due and everything's going to just go to hell in a handbasket. Right. Is that valid or? I don't think it is, no. Okay, I mean, why isn't it valid? I think, I think, you know, when you look at the, so convertible notes, and it's great that you pointed out because yeah. it really is an issue. And a few years ago, I was worried about it myself. But right. so convertible debt is basically a, a, a loan, right? right? An investor gives you money that is due after, usually after a year. Um, and then you are converting that in the next round of funding into equity. But in theory, they can ask for their money back, right? So, so the fear, um, you know, through the last couple of years was, well, isn't this all walking skeletons? These companies, if if the investors call call their note, 
and they're all bankrupt, right? Mm-hmm. They literally have to go into Chapter 11 by law because right. they can't, you can't pay it back. Um, I think that really hasn't materialized, um, and that's kind of the importance of raising money from a skilled investor, from a, certainly an accredited investor, someone has done this before. Um, and know, why? Because they understand that losing is part of winning and they don't freak out? Mm-hmm, yes, yes. It's, it's, well, there's a couple of legal legalities around it um, that, you, that you shouldn't raise money in private markets from people that are not accredited. Right. Basically, every investor on angel list is accredited. You can, you know, that's one, right. one Accredited measure. being you have a couple million dollars, you make a couple hundred thousand a year. Exactly. You're not going to get hurt losing 25K. Exactly. You understand, you know, this is, there's limited information, um, yeah. all those things. Um, you know, when you, when, you, when you look at that set of investors, one, they understand this. Um, the second thing is not just a credit investor, because literally every dentist in the country, I think, qualifies probably as an accredited investor. Sure. Um, looking at people that have done investments before, people that, you know, in a way have a reputation and a reputation to lose, right? If right. I ask for my money back, you know, someone else will find out about that and I will never get an investment again. So, but it right. really, I have never, I've never seen any investor calling their money back. Let's talk about uncapped notes. So mm-hmm. there are no, people do these promissory notes, yeah. these convertible debt notes, and then there's usually a cap, right? Like the converts at a certain value. Mm-hmm. But we've seen coming out of some of the accelerators, I don't know if it's in your case, uncapped notes, no discount. We do, we do. So yeah. I think it's, it's, it's a really, it's an important discussion to have. Um, I think, you know, when you look at uncapped notes, so we, 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 we don't do uncapped notes. It's, it's something, I actually see more uncapped notes outside of Silicon Valley from mm. investors that don't understand right. how this all works. They're like, oh, I get a 20% discount to the next round. Um, and they don't ask for a cap. They don't know about the cap. You know, the cap, the, con- the notion of caps is only about three or four years old that we've been doing this year and it's been right. taken some time that it proliferates. So explain what it is technically. Take us through a um, scenario that would be typical. Right. So if you have a, uh, if you raise money, let's say just, just for, for easy math, um, you raise a million dollars from a, a group of investors and uh, it's through a convertible note. This convertible note then sets um, usually a discount. So they get a discount to the next round of funding and a cap. Um, and it says, let's say if your next round of funding, so, so if, if the valuation, at, let's, let's just call it five million, again, mm-hmm. for the sake of easy math. Sure. Five million dollar cap, you get one million, um, so you have a six million dollar post money valuation of your company. Right. Your company now is worth quote unquote six million. Um, and, and caps and valuations are almost almost the same at this point. Mm-hmm. People really do talk about them in, in yeah. very much the same terms. If you then a year down the road raise um, more money, uh, let's say um, you raise another million dollars, at this point the company is valued at ten million dollars. So you uh, you put in extra mil- or put in another million. Ten million dollar valuation is eleven million dollar post. Um, this spread, um, the investors that invested early on will convert at five million. So effectively, for every hundred k they put in, they get two hundred k in the equity in the new round. Got it. That's basically how it works. Right. Um, if the, the discount uh, really applies when uh, when you have, let's say, you only raise at a four and a half million, so you raise at less than uh, than what you uh, what you had the cap at, um, then they get a discount. So four and a half million minus twenty percent, they get a discount for that. So it's yeah. basically, and uh, and uh, you know, so it's protection from somebody doing which I think Technorati did at some point with a convertible where. They were so hot. I just heard this uh-huh. secondhand, so I don't know if it's true. Um, but Technorati had a, you know, went from a convertible note to like a thirty million dollar round, and the people who were the angel investors converted at a thirty million dollar exactly. round, yes. and they had put in twenty five k when the company was worth two million. Yes, they should have owned one percent. Or that's exactly per- what it is. It's you know, if you as an as an investor, you put in money in these companies, they are very risky to begin with. You know, time is a major de-risking factor, right? Mm. Over time, the company makes progress, hires engineers, um, builds IP. Change, uh, challenges their assumptions, redoes it, gets customer, and the value continues to go up. Um, so if you uh, if you don't reward your earliest investors, hmm. um, something I think is wrong in the setup. So when we when 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 people talk about uncapped notes, you know, my question to them is, and that's why we we really don't do it at AngelPad. And yeah. I mean, every founder decides that for themselves, of course. But the uncapped note um, basically sends a very strong signal, in my view, to an investor um, that that you know. You don't really value them their money that early on, right? Um, you you do want to value. Kind it. of a slap in the face. Uh, it, you might not say it, but I would. <laughs> I do. I don't invest in uncapped notes. It's, it's I don't. certainly. I kind of find it like, and I wouldn't do it as an entrepreneur. Yeah. You know, it just doesn't feel right. Yeah. 
that you don't reward your early investors. They're taking the risk. I, I agree with you. But I think it's a luxury problem to have. I think there's very few companies that can pull that off. Right. Um, and, and the ones that have pulled it off. What about the crazy? I mean, I think some of the people coming out of the last Y Combinator class, $15 million caps. I think that's actually more dangerous almost than an unkept note, right? Why? Why is that? Why well, an unkept note, there's just no expectation. We're just saying, yeah. look, it's not capped. Like right. we don't know what the value is. Uh, you're getting a discount for sure, right? If you if you say you have a 15 million dollar um, you know cap, um, you really are saying, look, this is what we think the value is today. Mm -hmm. I think that's everyone's understanding, right? It's, yeah. Technically, it's not that, but under everyone's understanding. Now, if you look at your A round, um, you know investors expect a two x, two and a half, really three x would be nice. So if you cap at 15 million. Yeah, well, your A round's going to be 30, 45 30, million. 30, 45 million Good dollars, luck. right? And, and that's, that's hard to achieve. And now you have to look at now how much. Now you got to have 10 million you need. How much so money you did you raise? Five million dollars in. Exactly. Yeah. So, so how much money do you know? If you, if you have a $15 million cap and you raise $5 million, look, at least you have $5 million worth of time right. to back into the next valuation of 35 you got or 40 three years, million. Dollars, two or three right? years. So I think you know, there is. There is it all depends, like the valuation all depends how much money you raise, um, how much runway you have to your next to your next round, and really what your expectation is. Is there a bubble now? I mean, we saw color raise essentially an A and a B round at once, $40 yeah. million. Dollars. But Bill, very smart guy, we had him on the program. Color seemed like a really good idea, some good patent and IP from what I understand, proximity-based social networking. God, it sounded like such a great idea. It never really got executed. But I mean, people point to that as saying, like, that's the moment things got out of control. What's the state right now? Is it out of control? It's not out of control. No, I think why? I why think why? things have become uh, much more normal. I think as as more as more founders understand the implications of notes, mm -hmm. as we've gone through kind of one generation of founders that have raised at high notes, um, now going to the A round, seeing where they're at. I think you know things have become uh, things have become fairly normal again. Um, I think if anything, you see valuations slightly have come really down a little bit. Yeah. Um, and it's you know it's it's probably okay. You know you. Uh, you, uh, you know, with higher valuation comes more money that companies raise, and more money doesn't automatically equate to more success um, Why? or success faster. Why? Well, if you, uh, if you raise, you know, I, I think of a seed round kind of like, it's like a chewing gum, right? Look, if you raise 300K, you make it work for 12 months, 18 months, right? If you raise 3 million, guess what? You're going to make it work for, for the same amount of time, right? If you yeah. raise a lot of money, you, you hire faster, um, you, you, you often... What I see is you just kind of disregard some of the early signs of something not working because you don't have to worry about your next round as fast. So you're just much more aggressive in spending, much more aggressive in hiring. You're and gonna get not your as office focused earlier. on the data. It and, and like. exactly, you you just you know with the money comes problems. I mean, they're good problems to have, but um, if not really yeah. managed well, and you know you want you want founders to be uh, you know scrappy and resourceful and and kind of you know make it happen. Have this urgency like this. You know, when I look at founders and and the ones that that really stand out from the pack is the ones that have the urgency, the ones that, that can't stop moving in their in their chair and be like, look, I'm already thinking next thing while you're talking, right? And, right. And 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 those are the founders that just Fidgety. run faster. Yeah. Exactly. You know. If you, it's it, this is a marathon. Starting a company is a marathon, but every day is a single sprint, right? right? Wow. And the ones that get up every single day and sprint and don't, you know, rest on Saturday and Sundays, and the ones that don't say, "Look, let's have a down day," they're going to end up ahead because you know if you if you do ten percent more every single day, add that up in eighteen months. Yeah. You, know, you are it's you are months difference. and months and months ahead of the others and. There's no secret. It's right? compounding it's, interest too. It's, exa exactly, precisely. It's it's yeah. hard work every day. It's it's focus. It's uh, it's it's passion and it's it's drive. You know, and and never stop. I mean, that's what it All comes right. down to building. We companies. talked about co-founders. We talked about convertibles. We talked about the angel bubble. Let's talk a little bit about pivoting and knowing when to pivot and when to persevere. How does a founder know that they've hit a roadblock that they can't get through? or they've hit a door that they need to open. How do you know that? I mean, how do you, when people, they must come to you all the time. Thomas, you know, you're our mentor here. You, you, you brought us into this, you know, incredible space to be mentored. Is this a brick wall that we're not getting through? Or is it a doorway? We need to kick the door open. How do you, how do you assess that? It's it's a tough one. Um, so pivot. You know, let's just define pivot real quick because I think you know, in a way, in startup world, you pivot every single day. Like every every day, you have to adjust and kind of like find find the right iteration. Way, right? It, iteration, exactly. So when you when 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 uh, so pivoting is perfectly fine. People do it all the time. Now I, I think major pivot, pivot. Major pivot, exactly. Right. That's kind of you know when you go from um, you know focusing on one thing and really kind of like look, it's a new business. Like we're going to B to B B to C. 
Exactly. So, yeah. so, but if it's in the same realm, it's there, you can consider pivot. But I, I even see companies that are like going for something, this, and like really doing something. Social else. network. Um, now we're in auctions. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> and I think you know you have um, there are two realities. Um, one is, you know, you uh, you you onto something that just doesn't happen, right? It's like, look, we've tried, we've iterated, we have done, uh, I don't know, let's call it daily deals, okay? Everyone is like, you know, totally down on daily deals. You know, there was an early, early spike, you know, everyone thought this is like the next, next, uh, Amazon, know, Amazon, Google, whatever. eBay, and, yeah. and, and, you know, we've seen it doesn't work, right? The, uh, the long-term value of those customers is just not there. And, you know, the recent, the recent filings from, from, from Groupon kind of, you know, puts that on black and white. So yeah. that, that vertical is done, right? right? If you think you can innovate in that vertical, which is the other problem, right? You you cannot swim against the stream for four years straight, right? Eventually, you're just getting tired out, and this is literally, you know, a bird flying into the wind or flying with the wind. Um, right. You know, you just need or or an airplane. You need less fuel flying with the wind. If you are in an area. Well, there's just no appetite from investors, um, uh, and and we can talk about that separately because that's actually you know an important part of like where your company is. Are there actually investors that will mm. fund you um, in that space? But if you are just going against the stream, you can't you can't get some. It's 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 tiring. It's exhausting. You yeah. know, success is accelerating. Success carries you forward. Mm. Um, usually, founders know when to pivot. Um, when they come to me, um, it's often it's just like, look, I think we're going to do this, and and I say like, I think. You're right. You know, I think yeah. it's time. Um, so they know. I mean, it's you can only fly into the wind for so long before you're so exhausted. You know, you're not going to get there. It, it, it's something in your gut, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And you have, you know, you have that much fuel. You know, if you need to get from here to here, make sure you have enough fuel to get there. Right. Um, otherwise, you won't arrive. Oh, then. so sometimes it is possible you can fly into the wind for a long time and get to the new world, but you just it's not the time is not right. Yeah. yeah. The VCs yeah. don't have the appetite mm-hmm. for it. So maybe there is something with daily deals that could be done eventually. Absolutely. But the investors right now are just not going to come for I'll give you a few examples right yeah, now. That's how you forget. You know, daily deals, anything remotely related to that, most investors don't have a big appetite for it. I think there are some smart investors that see a huge... There is something. We know that, right? I mean, you don't build a group on an, uh, and, and, and a living so, social and like a bunch of other companies. Guilt. Like Google, and Google would prepay. be on it. Yelp. Like, they're smart people on yeah. this problem, right? So we know there is something. We just haven't quite figured out what exactly that something is. So I think if you and how big it is, exactly, it's huge. I mean, we, you know, when you when you look at the the really big markets, and that's something we talk a lot about. You know, really big markets. Look, we're going to eat three times a day, <laughs> right? Yeah. How much money have you spent today? Right? Eating. Probably half of the money you spent today was in food and beverages, right? Yeah. And and the other half was in, you know, taxis, get, taxis getting here. Uber, and, exactly. Uber, a little like this. So yeah, I think I think you know with that. We know there is something daily deals. There's very, very few investors have an appetite for it. Right. Um, you know, local in general. I mean, it's so everyone starts to realize how difficult it is to to reach these local businesses. Incredibly difficult. And that Mobile was one. Apps. Wasn't local one of the ones where people were like, "Oh my God, there's so much money spent locally," and uh, then they started trying and they realized. Oh my God, there's a lot of money, but they spend it $25 or $50 at a time, these advertisers and marketers. They're buying $75 ads in the yellow pages. Oh, it's too much work. $750 ads, that's the only money they spend. Um, Right. I think, you know, for me, for me, local, so I, you know, I'm a huge believer in local. I worked on Google Local back in, you know, very, very early days, Mm -hmm. um, took it, took it into UK. Um, I still believe very much in local space. We have a company in the local space in every session. We have one right now. Like I will keep believing in it. It is a massive market. Market, someone is going to figure it out. Very, very few investors are behind it. Mm-hmm. It's incre- incredibly easy to lose all your money in that space. Another one, which is, um, I just had the conversation uh, with mobile apps. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of people say, "Oh, there's not more mobile-first companies, and what's going on? It was the new promised land." Um, and the reality is, you know, getting getting downloads, getting distribution on mobile is incredibly difficult. I mean, it, it is makes, now. Yeah. yeah, it is. It is. You know, three years ago, Crowded. two years ago. You know, you, you could be featured by Apple or by in the Android store and do quite well. Today, it's just incredibly difficult. So mm. with that, investors look at, you know, what's your cost of distribution, right? We, generally speaking, in a consumer product, they don't want you to pay for distribution. They don't want you to, to pay to buy a customer, mm-hmm. right? Um, it needs to be, it needs to be viral. Needs to be, there needs to be some secret sauce, um, how you grow. Um, and in, in the world of, you know, mobile apps, it just, it's near impossible. So mm-hmm. we see very few mobile, mobile first companies funded right now that are not either infrastructure or have a very different approach to something. Right. And, and are investors a good proxy for this or are investors like um, a leading indicator, trailing indicator? 
Because you're independent in your approach, right? Like, you don't need to go to a bunch of LPs and beg permission. You can invest mm-hmm. your own money. So you kind of have a, spree, a, free, a free spirit, if you will. And as far as angels go, you get to, like myself, you place the bet that you want to bet. Our VCs, let's talk about them for a minute. <laughs> You know, like and you laugh a little expression. bit. Because, well, I'm making a little bit because you know, I guess we all know as entrepreneurs that some of the VC they're not created equal. There are some amazing ones who provide massive value, but there are some best described as lemmings. So I did last night. I spent the entire evening with the founders. We started at six. We left here at midnight, and I talked about VCs. I talked about the different tiers of VCs. So I think. Now, when people talk about VCs in general, they just bucket everybody into the bucket of mm. VCs. And I think you know, we need to start to understand, founders need to start to understand the different, the different types of VCs, you know, the different types of, of investors. Um, mm. So you know, and, and I, I run them down really quickly that how I see them and mm. kind of like where they fit in. Yeah, take me through that. Um, so you have the angel investors. You know, those are people, smart people like you that were successful as entrepreneurs. They yeah. put their 25, 50K down you know, in something they believe. You know, they really very much like retail investors. Like, you know, I like it. I see it. I can touch it. You know, I'm excited about it. I want to do it. Um, the next step up from that is really the, the, the super angels, uh, which are the ones that do this. The Saka, the prolific- Arrington, Saka, Saka has fun. No, those are funds. Those are funds. Yeah. So, so the super angels, I really look at, you know, if you would be doing 30 or 40 investments. and right. like instead of five. Three or four of your buddies in LA said, hey, you know what? I'm going to give you a couple hundred K too. Let's, I'll pull this together. Yeah. We have a few million dollars or so. Like This is still like very very mm. much the, uh, the friends approach. Exactly. I look at this angels. You know, then you have the micro VCs. The micro VCs is really, I think it's one of the best things that can happen for, or could have happened, has happened for Silicon Dave Valley. McClure, um, Dave Mike McClure, Arrington. Um, uh, Mike Arrington, you have, you have uh, you know, Pivot North. You know, a lot of them are, are, don't have a huge brand. 20, you know? 30, 40 million dollars. Um, sm- yeah, smaller amounts. Um, these guys often come from the traditional firms, or, or mostly a, 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 a single LP. And the dynamics in those firms are very different. You know, the, the decision process is very different. Um, the, uh, the economics uh, for them to make money are very very different. So you know the the carry that they get is is is, is only two percent. Every fund gets that two two and a half percent. So th- it's barely like a salary for them. So it's really about returning the fund and making returns on top yeah, of that. Two percent to, to make carry. twenty million is four hundred thousand. They could be make a lot more money going to work for a VC. Absolutely. Firm. You know they would they would work at a VC. They would work at M and A, Google or Facebook. They would make a lot more. And these are yeah. very smart people. Um, what's interesting about those guys and there are two. There's not enough of them in Silicon Valley right. today. Um, they really spend time with the companies. You know, they spend time in the way that I spend at the seed stage, at the very earliest stage. They take them from the seed stage really to the A. They understand this. They understand mm-hmm. taking something that you can't value on paper to the point where the, where the, where the, where the larger VCs can... They're like Sherpas. They just they, they yes. escort them yes. from this... And they're great. I mean, they yeah. really understand this. They've done this before. There's a process to it. You know, as, as boring as it is, there's a process to fundraising, to building a company. You now, from there, you really have the, uh, the, uh, the uh, kind of you know, smaller funds. So those are the Blumbergs of the world. True, uh, you know, first $100 round. million dollar first round. Exactly. Yeah. Those are, those are great. You know, they're great in a, in, a, in, a, in a seed round if they are a major investor in your company and the, the smart yeah. ones really become, you know, the trues and the first rounds become major investors early on. Um, they have a lot of support system. Usually there's multiple, multiple um, partners. You know, there's yep. admins. There's sometimes other resources you can tap into. And from there you have, you know, this, this category that I call the, the product market fit VC. So those are VCs mm-hmm. that you go to once you have product market fit and you have something that is very clearly defined and you basically start... You start getting to the point where you need to figure out how we're going to make money with this, how we're going to hire salespeople, how we're going to, mm. you know, how we're going to open offices in in, in, in in one or two countries. You know, those leveling up. This is like a whole different level. Those exactly, of operation. exactly. And those guys are really there's some. You know, these are the early investors. In, Sequoia, in, Benchmark, uh, ben, Excel. Yes, those are great examples. Great examples of that. Yes, yeah. and. The they're going to put in three or four million dollars easily, and they're going to go to work easily. Yes, and they're going to have high expectations. They have high expectations, but they're your partner in this. You know, yeah. they take a board seat. Um, so they're they not going to be taskmasters, but they're going to expect of themselves and of the management team that progress is made. Absolutely. You know, these are. I mean, look, if you if you don't look at your investor as a partner in your business, yeah. you know, don't don't take them as investors, mm. right? These are. 
you know, I mean, look, people are, 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 are begging for a partner's time at any of these major firms. I mean, the, the brain power they have, the thing they've seen, you know, they've, you know, as a founder, you in your company, you do one company, it takes you, you know, six, eight years, 10 years to exit the company and to be successful, you've done it once. These guys sitting alongside the Airbnbs and the Dropbox and the Oracles and the Salesforce and the, you know, these guys go back for the past 10 years to Google's, like they've seen companies going from a few hundred, you know, to, uh, to, to tens of thousands of, of people. So those are great partners. And the final, the final session, the final one is really like the, uh, almost a financial institution, it's the growth investor. Those are the people that put $10 million in um, and it's really just, look, there's a small fire here, let's pour oil on it, let's make it a really big fire. Um, and when we talk about VCs, we just lump them all together. So right. I think we don't do them justice at which stage they're the right people for. You know, it's And it's impossible to tell. If you're a first-time entrepreneur, how would you ever know? It is, you're just yes. reading blogs and seeing tweets, you don't really know. Yeah. Exactly. And we have, you know, a lot of founders say, oh, you know, we're excited. We, you know, I don't know, XYZ is coming in. Chris Saka is coming in. It's like, yeah. well, Chris Saka has 80 plus investments and, and is a busy guy, right? You know, when you, when you look at someone, you know, being with you, and he's very upfront about it, right? Um, someone that actually takes you from here to the next step. You need someone that makes, you know, eight or 10 investments a year, you know, puts in six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollars $800,000, you know, really is, is there for you. Um, right. so, so, you know, we just need to start looking at these, these different tiers of investors. They're all great at their right level. Yeah. If you take the wrong, the wrong investor uh, or the right investor at the wrong time, it's equal a bad investor. You've kept <clears throat> AngelPad purposely, I don't want to say small, but not gratuitously large. You've, you've kept it to an appropriate size, I would say, a dozen companies a dozen, a year. A dozen companies, yes. But you have the ability to raise an almost unlimited amount of money given the track record. You could raise much more money. You could have a five times bigger operation, at least two or three times bigger, but you haven't. Why? You know, it, it really comes down to your approach. Um, my approach is... You know, we're looking for the best founders we can find out of a large pool. 2,000 applications, we pick out 12. And we really spend the time it needs with those 12 to make 12 of them successful. Um, it, it doesn't always happen. Uh, we certainly have failure and we have success. Um, but we... Um, we're, this, we're so involved in these companies uh, in really thinking through everything from what is an interesting market? Is it, is it really a large problem you're solving? You know, how much is this worth to people? How much would they pay for it? How much is this possible to make money with in the future? Um, you know, what is the right composition of, of your, your workforce you know, in, in the next year or so? Everything, right? I'm, I'm in here. You know, this is, this is my office. Yeah. We're, we're in here every single day with half-hour meetings with these companies. We iterate, we iterate, we go through, we challenge their assumptions. You know, I'm the bad guy in this, right? I'm right. like, look, this is, this is not going to do it. Like if, if you, like, if you don't figure out this, like, you're not going to talk to investors. If you, tell, if you give an investor this answer, like, yeah. he will not, he's done with you. He will never tell you to your face, but he will just, the yeah. signal it just flipped. Um, so that's what we do. The, the, the other approach is to say, well, we take a very large, um, large mass in, and, and some of them will be successful. And, and through our network and others, you know, we'll make them successful. But I, look, I do this, I started AngelPad. I was an individual investor coming out of Google. I left Google because I started having so many conflicts, um, right. uh, because Google started doing voice, you know, Google Voice. And yeah, actually, sure. and you could you couldn't, at one point, you couldn't invest in a company in Silicon Valley without Google possibly being a competitor in the future. Sure. And it's turned out to be absolutely correct. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah. I left. I left Google. Unfortunately, Google Ventures at the time wasn't didn't exist because that right. uh, Google Ventures is 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 a, is, a, is a great place as well. Um, and you know, I started investing in these companies, and what I found is that you know you uh, you invest in them at the stage uh, you know where they they are out to invest, and they 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 kind of have their hypothesis, and they kind of you know get their five hundred k or eight hundred k, and they're very validated in what they do. And often I saw it as like a false validation. Like investors mm -hmm. didn't invest in them because of the product that they built, invest in it because they saw the spark in their eyes, because they saw the potential. But the founders kind of say, well, we just raised 800K for this awesome product. I mean, everyone loves it. Like, we're not going to change right. something now. So you end up having this conversation where like, wow, I, I, I wish we would have met six months ago when you decided to go down this way, because like, I think this is actually more interesting problem doing this, I, but over here. It's interesting. You, the... Obviously, the two big competitors in the space, not that you're really competitors because there's so, many, so much good that can be done, but Techstars and uh, Y Combinator, of course. Y Combinator pulling back, actually. I think they peaked at 80-something, maybe even 90 mm -hmm. startups in the last class. And people, um, multiple people commented to me, way too many. Can't remember 
and it felt a little cookie cutter and less mm-hmm. personal. Is that the danger that people are just pumping too many into the system and there'll be too many orphans and zombies? I mean, everybody coming out of what Combinator are now starts with Ron Conway, you know, and um, Yuri Milner Yuri Miller, right. as an investor, which to me, as an angel, if somebody came to me and said, I had Yuri Milner and Ron Conway as an investor, it's like, I got to take the meeting. Mm-hmm. Now there's 250 people a year who have Ron Conway, and right, it's, right, it's right. sort of created a signaling problem for me, at least. I don't know if Ron Conway or Yuri Milner has ever met that founder, right? right? I mean, so is that a problem? That you think they're going too big? I mean, I know you don't want to cast aspersions, but you've chosen to stay smaller, and I think that your approach is intentional. It is very much so. I mean, I, you know, I want to I wanna be with founders every day. This, this is the stuff yeah. I like to do. I like to talk product. I like to talk, you know, I'm, I'm getting excited about this. You know, for me, it's, uh, this is living through them founding multiple companies, right? I, you know, I know how hard it is to start a company. I know what, what they go through. You know, I'm, I'm at the, I have the fun job of talking to them too of these like really big ideas and like what are we going to go after, you know? So, and yeah. I can do this 12 times, you know, twice a year. I do this 20, 25 to 30 companies a year. So look, I, I have the best job in the value if you ask me, right? right. Um, I love what I do. So for me, it's really getting to know these guys, you know. If it was four times bigger, it would be miserable, wouldn't it? It would be, it would be intense. I, I don't, I, look, we it couldn't, would be miserable. We couldn't, Come on, if you we couldn't, couldn't even remember it. the founders' names. <laughs> That's true. I, I mean, do think it. about it. If you had to do four times as many. Yeah. I, I, I certainly couldn't do it the way I want to do it um, I couldn't do it I think you know you know, if there is, I, I don't have a lot of sympathy for investors that say, oh, I can't remember the 80 companies that went through with the Y Combinator. Look, it's an investor's job to listen up and go through. Yeah. You already have the luxury of sitting there and getting them in one, in one three hour it meeting. It is one kind of, it, right? it, it's yeah. as, as hard as it is, but that's your job as, as an investor to go through that. So I, I think to, and to filter through that, you know, for, uh, for me, I've always said, you know, I, I want to be in a position where if an investor calls me and says, look, I'm looking at these three companies or I'm looking at this one company, you know, what are they good at? What do they need help with? Where mm-hmm. do you think it's going to go? And I can, you know, truly, honestly tell them because I know I've been there. I've been through the journey. I know why they picked this. I know the founder dynamics. I know what they're going for. I know if they're going to, you know, be tempted by an exit for 10 million to Facebook. Or you want to be able big. to speak credibly about the people you're associating with. Yes, exactly. And I think yeah. with that, you know, it's, it's, it de-risks the investment in, in a company coming out of AngelPad right. uh, because investors can get a lot more background from someone that has been with them for you know for for three four months and the the cla- the spring class of 12 10 million dollars in 60 days yeah it was just the that first 60 fast. days that was pretty mad yeah that was that was wow uh, it was it was you know it was one of those where just a lot of companies um you know at that stage where investors say look you know we don't need to put 500k in this company we can put 2 million in this company like That's you great. know it's, it's you're just at a different stage oftentimes you know silicon valley technology is a winner take all game right there's only one search engine there really is only one social network there's really only one photo sharing app there really is only one you know local review site and we know the names right yeah. it's it is a winner take all game in technology if you're in the consumer world if you winner take almost all second place takes a little it takes a little third exactly. place and on takes nothing Thing. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> it takes so, on a lot of pain. So you really, you really want to, you know, if you see a company that you can see a category killer in anything, you know, in Lean in, in. A, in whatever. It's not just consumer yeah. side, but in in cloud management, in, in everything, in mobile infrastructure. Like you just, it's like, look, like how fa- how much faster can we run with more money? And if if the inflection of, of more money actually makes you execute faster, um, rather than just procrastinating on decisions and and making bad decisions, it's good. And that's exactly what happened with the last class. Number one thing that's a red flag for you when you're looking through applicants. What's your number one red flag that you just go, ugh, <laughs> just no, you know? Um, is it a misspelling on the form? Is it it's, it's, actually, bad those, design? I, those things matter. I mean, it's certainly, you know, we ask people for a two-minute video. Hmm. Uh, look, if people don't take the time to do a two-minute video, it, that's a very much a no-brainer. Like, right. I don't care if you're ex-Google engineer and you think you don't have to do it. Like, th- that is the minimum requirement. Because you are not motivated. Exactly. It's like, look, we're gonna, we're gonna, yes, we're not gonna give you a huge amount of money, but you know, we're, we're putting our name to us. Like, if you don't put that effort in with me, are you gonna put in the effort after you met a partner at at great firm X, yeah. who's gonna come back to me and say, oh, I never heard from those guys again? Oh, they told me they're gonna send me something, they didn't send it. Right. Um, so, so those so early that signals. follow through. It's, it's really, signs. it's really, it's really important. Look, you got to be buttoned up. You don't. It just 
You have to be. That, that's a that's a minimum yeah. minimum requirement. What's the one thing you can? Oh, you were going to say something. I think, yeah. So yeah. so the other the other part really is I think what I mentioned earlier is if, if people haven't committed. Um, you know mm. if if uh, people are still somewhere in a company. If one founder is in London and the other one is in LA and they have never met. Like those things are just like you know you, you can't start a company like that. This right. is not, it's not so a if, if you're ten, I always. Yeah. I always I tell these guys all the time, it's like, look, someone is gonna give you a million dollars. Are you really gonna walk around like this? Are you really gonna have your drinking pictures, you know, from the last party on your Facebook profile yeah. when you have when you have ten employees? Yeah. Like are you really you're gonna be a founder of a company, you're gonna lead this company, yeah. um, you're gonna hire people, you're gonna have to lay off people or fire people. You, know, you are a role model for your company. And look, I can't train that in three months or in six months. Like mm -hmm. I either see it and you have it or you don't. If you don't yeah. have it, can't do it. What's what are you a sucker for? If you see something in a presentation, you just go, I gotta meet them. I like get them in here as quick as possible. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a sucker. I'm a sucker for uh, for uh, you know ex ex uh, ex Google engineers, ex Twitter engineers, uh, mm. people people that really have ex uh, Apple engineers. I mean the companies that have the highest hiring bar in the valley. Ah. Um, if I a Palantir, we heard a bunch of ex Palantir engineers. Look, I mean if you if you got into that. Um, and especially if you got in early, yeah. I'm going to talk to you. Like I'm, I'm unless you're really, really off limits and you want to do like a, you know, recipe. For me, book. it's like a great domain name and design. I see like a great I, domain name, and I'm like, how did you get that domain? That's true. I just want to know how you got that domain name. Like, okay, really, you have square.com. What I just, how did you get that domain? I just want to hear that story. How did you get that? I like I, that's true. It's, I mean, or like that design is just stunning. A great, path. great design. I'm path, really right? afraid. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, great we always, domain. Great We always see comments like this. It looks great, and you're like, damn, that looks good. And I, absolutely, great design yeah. matters a, a, a enormous amount. All right, listen. Thomas, uh, we could talk literally for five hours, but you have to go run your business, and uh, I, uh, I have to run mine too. And, you do. and listen, the audience uh, really thanks you. You were so honest, and you went over so many of the blocking and tackling things, and that's really why I really wanted to have you in the program because I know that you help these uh, startups here at Launchpad block and tackle. I'm sorry, Angelpad. What did I say, Launchpad? Launchpad is LA. There's a Launchpad is it? in LA. Yeah. Damn. No, <laughs> AngelPad. And uh, if everybody wants to get more information on AngelPad, they can go to? AngelPad.org. AngelPad.org. So just go to AngelPad.org. If you want to follow Thomas, he's Thomas K on Twitter. And apply and build a team, yeah. right? Think, think change early. Change the world. Think early about starting a company. Give yourself time just to, to prepare it and then do it. Yeah. I mean, the downside risk is what? Yeah. A boring job at yeah. Google. Exactly. Exactly. Hey, uh, and thank you to our friends at MailChimp and New Relic for sponsoring uh, the episode. We couldn't do it without you guys. And thanks, Brandis, for lugging all this crap up here and being my partner in crime on all these great episodes. Thanks, Brandis. She busts her ass carrying all this stuff. What time do you fly up here? 6 a.m.? 6 a.m. She takes. See this. It's hard for me to get on that like 8 a.m. flight. She, she showed up here in the office. She takes. There were she any take the flight. She takes two flights earlier than me. Warrior. She was, she was in here Brandis. earlier than uh, than 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 most I love people. Love Brandis. Uh, um, working in San Francisco here. Samurai. So. Samurai. She's one of my samurai. All right. We'll see you all next time on the cool. startups. Thanks, Jason.